that. <laughs> uh, we'll probably have a few people still coming in, but that's fine. Um, welcome to Cranbrook Art Museum. I'm Andrew Blavelt, the director. Um, and welcome back to the DeSalle Auditorium. It's been a year and a half, I don't know, <laughs> 20 years, something like that in pandemic time. Um, so I'm very glad to see actual faces. Um, we are uh, webcasting this live and it'll be archived on the DeSalle uh, gallery, or the DeSalle channel on YouTube. Um, so if you know someone that wanted to attend, we were also trying to figure out our capacity limits as the state was changing them <laughs> routinely. So I'm just glad that people were able to make it and hopefully you'll be able to see the exhibition on view in the museum as well. <clears throat> and I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Deborah Libera Koska, Koski, who will be speaking about the art and life of Artist Lane. Um, artists studied painting at Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1951 and was recently awarded an honorary Master of Fine Arts degree by the Academy at its graduation this May. It was gracious enough to share a few words of wisdom with the class of 2021, which I guess includes you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I understand the artist will say a few words at the end of the talk, um, so you'll want to stick around for that. Now, I was first introduced to the work of Artist Lane by Chuck DeCat, who I'm glad to see is here uh, tonight from Collected Detroit. And together with, I think Debbie was with me at the time. <laughs> we kind of, Debbie's always around. <laughs> We're always connecting on different things. Um, so we, uh, we thought this is an amazing opportunity to shine a light on artists from our perspective. She has many lights shine in her. It's our own ignorance um, <laughs> that we're trying to enlighten. And um, spoke to the Academy's former director, Susan Ewing, about this necessary and long overdue honor for artists and an honor for us. And I also wanted to be sure that we included artists in the current project about the history of the Academy of Art um, called With Eyes Opened, which is on view in the museum's galleries, all of them, and uh, through September 19th. So if you're not able to see it tonight, there's plenty of time still left this summer. And it also features a rather mammoth publication that documents 200 um, artists, architects, and designers that have studied at the Academy since it was founded in 1932. And so we were very pleased and thankful to Chuck for making that connection. He's a font of wisdom and knows more about the Academy than I do. <laughs> so my goal is to know as much as Chuck does. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Debbie Kosky, who is an adjunct associate professor of art history at Madonna University. Um, she holds her MA and PhD from Princeton University. And she's a familiar face to our audiences. And you may recall that she presented her res research on Ruth Adler Schnee in 2019, pre-pandemic, I guess, just March, before the pandemic. March 1st, 2020. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, March 1st. You got just, the, probably you were the last speaker. Exactly. That's kind of fitting, the last speaker, <laughs> the, last, the new speaker for this year. Um, but you also might remember Debbie from her work um, on Alexander Girard, of which she wrote the book Alexander Girard Architect, documenting his architecture work, especially here in the Detroit area, and particularly Gross Point, where he lived and worked. Um, her current research subject is, of course, Artist Lane, and we look forward to hearing more about artists and this esteemed artist this evening. So if you could please help me welcome Debbie Kosky. Thank you so much, Andrew, and to everyone at Cranbrook who made this presentation possible, including Sarah Doty, uh, Amanda Coe, and Laura Bombeck, who's doing the, all the tech stuff. Um, of course, my talk complements the current exhibition, and Artist Lane's portrait of Diane Carroll is right outside, so make sure that you view that. And again, if you didn't get a chance to view the exhibition, come back again and make sure to purchase the gorgeous catalog. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of reiterate what Andrew said a little bit. I'm just so happy to be giving a talk here, and I, I do believe that my talk on Ruth Adler Schnee was the last talk. I remember we, us saying, are we shaking hands or are we doing elbows? And we're like, no, we're shaking hands. And then, of course, that all changed for a while. And I'm just so happy to see a live audience now. I know we're trying to keep it, you know, keep it low just with the pandemic um, um, controls, but I'm very happy to be back here again. 
And I have to thank Chuck Duquette also because it was Chuck, I believe, that um, uh, brought artists and her family to the Ruth Adler Schnee Lecture, and that was the first time that I met her back March 1st, 2020. And so many wonderful things have happened since then. Um, and of course, my deepest thanks go to artists, uh, her daughter Carol, and her niece Leslie Brown for facilitating the interviews that I did with her. And this was during COVID. Uh, a lot of people say that they learned to play the piano during COVID, and I always say I'm going to have to learn to play the piano later, because I was interviewing Artist Lane, and that was my highest priority. Um, and these interviews um, offered me the opportunity, and this is one that I will always treasure, to glimpse the woman behind the art. And artists, I need to tell you that your, your talent, your humility, your faith, and your unwavering resolve in the face of adversity is a guiding light for me and for us all. Well, I will start off um, with a brief but telling story about artists. Artist Shreve Lane has always been guided by a higher power. Indeed, artist traces her mission in life back to an epiphany she had at the age of five while living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She had wandered across the street from her home to a deserted field that held the remains of the Bureau Machine tool, tool Company. Immersed in a sea of wildflowers much taller than herself, she recalls not fear, but inspiration by the wonderment of nature, a feeling that she understood even at her young age the secrets of the universe. But when she ran back to tell her mother, she discovered that she didn't have the words to describe her experience. Only years later would she explain, God created us all for a purpose. I knew that I knew I was going to be an artist. Indeed, throughout her seven decade plus career, artist Lane has always preferred to let her art speak for you, for her. Her work encompasses, as we will see, an awe-inspiring range of media and themes, from oil and pastel portraits to monumental bronze sculptures celebrating social justice pioneers and deep metaphysical concepts. And she is still working at the age of 94, even though I think many of us don't believe that she is 94 looking at her. She does not look her age. My presentation will provide an overview of the life and art of Artist Lane, structured in three parts that correspond with the three primary chronological periods of her career. Part one, Becoming, covers the foundational period beginning with her ancestry in early life and her studies as an artist in Canada and Detroit between the years 1927 to 62. Part two, Arriving, covers the period between 1962 and the late 1980s, in which she established herself as a leading portraitist in New York and Los Angeles and made artistic statements on social justice issues. Part three, Emerging, deals with the current phase of her career from circa 1990 to the present, in which she focused primarily on the medium of bronze sculpture and on metaphysical topics. As we will see, artists views the creative process as a metaphor for the larger journey of life, not only her life, but that of humanity as a whole. Artist Lane still recalls her first sculpture, made from the thick mud near the stream by her grandparents' home, saying, my grandmother Mary Shad had only one toy for us to play with a cloth doll with porcelain head, hands, and feet. Artist, then seven years old, made her own clay figure, inspired by the doll. She adds, no one told me, but I instinctively knew to put my creations under the shade of the porch so that they would dry slowly and not crack in the sun. One could say that Artist's life and art was shaped by her early experiences in Canada and in Michigan. She was born Artist Marie Shreve on May 14, 1927, near the rural village of North Buxton in Ontario, Canada, known as a haven for fugitive slaves and free people of color. Looking back to her birth, she views the name Artist bestowed by her mother as prophetic of her future career. Yet this destiny was equally shaped by her family's history of social and political activism, going back to abolitionist Abraham Shad, 
who moved his family from Delaware to Ontario following the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, and his daughter, Lane's great-great-aunt, Mary Ann Shad Carey, whom we see on the left, who was the first female newspaper editor in North America and the second woman to earn a law degree at Howard University. As a child, Artis recalls listening in to conversations between the town elders and her grandfather, Garrison Shad. When asked about her presence, Shad replied, she's an artist, she needs to know about the world. And she remembers being kind of at the top of the stairs listening in. Given this heritage, it is significant that Lane's first sculptures were created near the home of her maternal grandparents and that she would later celebrate the achievements of civil rights heroines like her ancestor, Mary Ann Shad Carey, and her friend Rosa Parks through sculpture. Artists received a progressive education, one exposing her to the arts in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the family moved when she was five years old. After the family moved back to Canada, her prodigious talent was recognized by family and friends and cultivated by teachers such as Marie Campbell, and I believe this is Marie Campbell's classroom, and that's artists right there, Miss Hall and Alice McCoy, who all supported her studies in art. Artists views this wonderful 1941 self-portrait drawing as an early step in, quote, her journey to find her true self beyond the material, unquote. In it, the artist discerns her 14-year-old self in double. As reflected in the full-length mirror in the family's living room, and in the sketch on her drawing board. Her expression, accentuated by an upturned brow and illuminated by an unseen light, captures a precocious resolve. Indeed, while artists had already faced bigotry, she was clearly determined to rise above it, her favorite phrase, and succeed in the art world. I need to add that, of course, this is a mirror image, so uh, she appears to be right-handed, but artists, like many of the great artists throughout history, is left-handed. Um, also, I need to mention that uh, later, she returned to find the drawing and found that there was this kind of uh, stain on the paper. Um, but instead of being upset, she recognized the fact that uh, she viewed it as kind of a happy accident. Um, that it was not a mistake per se, and that this um, kind of stain bisects her figure and kind of illuminates uh, her face and her drawing board. In 1942, 15 year old artist won the Dominion of Canada Award, followed in 1946 by an Edith Chapman four year scholarship, which facilitated her studies at the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. Her time at university also marked the beginning of her professional career. She recalls, I hired myself out to do murals, lettering, portraits, anything to supplement her scholarship money. Indeed, Artis was so dedicated to her career, she once stated, I don't intend to marry ever. I will devote my whole life to art. Her life changed course during the summer of 1949 when she met journalist and activist Bill Lane. The couple married on Christmas Day, 1949, prompting a move from Toronto to Detroit. Daughter Carol was born the following year. In the fall of 1951, as we can see from this uh, roster here, um, artist began her studies at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. She was the first black woman admitted to the school. She describes her period at Cranbrook as tumultuous and painful, saying, you might say I came of age. She recalls that her mission was initially contested and then approved only through intervention by the Urban League of Detroit. However, artist recalls inspiring words from then Art, Museum, Art Academy director Zoltan Zepeshi, who encouraged her to continue her studies in fine art. So she recalls him fondly. After her divorce in the mid-1950s, artist turned to portraiture to support herself and her young daughter. And here's a wonderful um, photo of them in Detroit. During this time, she scored prominent commissions from Detroit's social and political elite, including members of the Scripps, Booth, Kresge, and Erb families. We heard a little bit about that from uh, John Erb before the lecture. State Senator Charles Diggs Sr. and Governor George Romney. Romney, uh, Lane recounts that Mrs. Romney, 
quote, showed me a closet full of portraits that they had commissioned and hated. Romney, Governor Romney, reluctantly agreed to sit for yet another portrait. We ended up having a two-hour discussion on race and politics after the sitting, and they hung my portrait. In April of 1958, Artis was one of the leading young artists featured in Ebony Magazine, giving her national exposure for her work as a portrait, portraitist. And here's a wonderful um, photo um, that was found uh, in this Ebony Magazine. I just found this on Instagram. There's a library that had posted that. And in Detroit at the time, she was part of a group of artists that included sculptor Oliver uh, Legrand and painter Huey Lee Smith. Um, through them, artists met Langston Hughes, who actually did a poetry reading at her house. Her life changed again in 1962 after she met actress Diane Carroll, who was in Detroit to star in a new Richard Rogers musical, No Strings. And of course, if you missed it, this magnificent portrait is just outside, um, and you can see it on your way out. Lane's portrait of Carroll commands the viewer's attention with its dynamic brushstrokes and bold color palette, which capture both the physical presence and the charismatic persona of the actress. And if you're in front of it, I think you agree that she actually appears to be striding towards you. I must add here that Carol's role in the musical was groundbreaking for its depiction of an interracial romance and for the fact that the role led to Carol becoming the first African-American performer to earn a Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical. As you can see um, from the photo at the right, which was taken um, during the 1980s, um, artists remained friends with Diane Carroll until the actress's death in 2019. The meeting also opened up a new horizon for Artist Lane, who bonded immediately with Carroll, prompting the actress to ask, what are you doing here in Detroit? You belong in New York. About a month later, Artis moved to New York City to start a new chapter in her life and career. So now we're moving into uh, part two of the talk, and I need to introduce this with another wonderful anecdote. Um, this one relating to Cary Grant, who was a dear friend of hers. It was a night to remember. Artis Lane had come to Los Angeles from New York by 1964, and soon afterwards received an invitation from screen legend Cary Grant. Artist had painted a portrait of Grant and he wanted to see it. His response was surprising. Artist recalls, he slid gracefully down to the ground and turned the painting upside down, asking not about the likeness, but about my technique, how I had achieved such depth and rich translucent colors. The event marked both the beginning of a deep friendship and the ascent of Artis's career as a portraitist, which had begun during her time in Detroit and continued during her time in New York City in the early 60s, where she had moved at the behest of Carol. There she was associated with Portraits Incorporated, an agency which connected elite clientele with respected portrait painters. Until Artis's arrival, both groups were exclusively white. While in New York, Lane completed portraits of prominent New Yorkers, uh, such as the one we see at left, Mrs. Robert Strauss Schlossberg of the New York Times, and public figures such as Jackie and John F. Kennedy. And we see a portrait of John F. Kennedy on the right. By 1964, Artis had moved to California, reuniting there with her daughter, Carol. And in the same year, uh, she met uh, actor, agent, producer, Vince Cannon, who I also should, could say is the love of her life, who would serve as her life partner and manager until his death in 1998. And here's a wonderful um, photo of Vince in his convertible that I've heard some stories about. And it says September 1964, so that's early on. Um, at left is a portrait that artist did of Vince, and at right is a photograph of artists in their uh, Riverside Drive home and sometime in 1968 or 1969. As we can see here on the table, this is the uh, cover of a special LA Times Magazine section that she had done um, with portraits of children. With Vince Cannon's help, Lane developed a reputation as the celebrity portrait painter in Los Angeles. Her subjects included figures from the world of stage and screen, 
arts, entertainment, and sports and business, uh, along with politics and philanthropy. The former included a range of Hollywood stars, too long to, to list, uh, but I'm showing you here Diane Cannon, uh, and on the right, Oprah Winfrey, a um, little bit later portrait that was actually commissioned by the actor Jamie Foxx and presented to Oprah on her TV show in 2006, at which time she mentioned that Artist Lane was one of her favorite artists. Other luminaries um, are, come from the world of entertainment and sports, such as Quincy Jones, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Magic Johnson, and Michael Jordan. The portrait at left um, gives us a, a view into the uh, edgy side of the New York social scene in the early 70s. Uh, this is a portrait of baby Jane Holzer, who was an edgy socialite uh, turned model who uh, was for a time Andy Warhol's it girl. And here's a photo of her at center with Andy Warhol. Here is a photo of artists with the portrait. And you can see um, what a large commanding um, scale uh, this portrait has. Um, she also evidently took art lessons um, from artists at the time. Perhaps her most high profile portraits come from the world of society, politics, and philanthropy. Um, and these were, most of these were commissioned by the National Art Association, for the National Art Association's annual event, uh, the Orchid Ball, that was held at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Artist recalls that the designer Nolan Miller made a gown for her each year. And we can see um, these portraits and the uh, honorees uh, every year are documented. And many of these were publicized uh, in the news. Sadly, artist was not paid for these portraits um, and the, the publicity was viewed um, as her payment. Subjects included Walter and Lee Annenberg, who we see on the left, Gordon Getty, Claire Booth Luce, Nancy Kissinger, and Barbara Bush, who is shown at right. Um, she often did two portraits, um, uh, two variations of the portrait. A personal note from Barbara Bush indicates that Artis's portrait passed what she called the true test, uh, and that was a spot on the wall of their main home. She notes that those painted by other artists were relegated to the closet. So I think if, you don't, uh, if you're a portrait painter, you never know where your artwork ends up. But um, I think most of artists has end, ended up on the wall. Artists sculpted busts include Presidents Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama, whom she credits in part for inspiring her to become an American citizen. And at center, we see a photo of Artist Lane when she met um, uh, uh, Obama when he was uh, giving a speech, I think it was a book, book talk um, at the California African American Museum. And I should note that Ronald Reagan indicated his approval of his bust um, by signing, uh, inscribing his name in the clay model. However, while she has often been characterized as a painter to the stars, artists rejects that title. Instead, she attributes her success in portraiture to her fine arts training, her sensitivity of line, color, and design, and her innate ability to capture what she calls the life spark of her sitters. Indeed, when I asked her recently how long it takes to complete a portrait, artist responded, quote, all my life plus a few intense hours, unquote. The comment demonstrates her rare combination of talent, training, and intuition. And it reminded me of a famous quote um, by the American portrait painter James McNeil Whistler. And we see Whistler's self-portrait at right, and this is a masterpiece that is at the DIA. When asked how he could charge 200 guineas for the labor of two days, Whistler famously responded, I ask for it the knowledge that I have gained in the work of a lifetime. Key to Lane's success is a secret technique that she used first in her portrait of Diane Carroll's daughter, Suzanne Kay, and that's the portrait that we see at center. She first articulates the structure and depth of the figure through brush strokes of Damar varnish tinted with burnt umber before adding strokes of pastel on top. A prime example of this technique is Lane's 1971 portrait of fine art and fashion photographer Douglas Dubler, best known for shooting the Rolling Stones and covers for Italian Vogue. 
He also shot artists in Vince, as we see at left. So this would have been, I believe, during the 70s. Artist recalls that Dubler's energy, quote, filled the room. And she captures it like prey, she jokes, quickly yet vividly on paper. And there's certainly like a very powerful, masculine, kind of animalistic um, energy emanating um, from Dubler. We can see the effectiveness of the DeMar varnish technique in the Dubler portrait. As artist explains, the gray beige of the paper serves as the mid-tone running through his head and body, contrasting with highlights in white pastel. And then you can see uh, various different highlights. And with the deeper areas of the dark oil varnish, making the image pop and come alive. And I recently had a conversation with Douglas Dubler, who is living in New York, and he's still um, uh, working as a photographer. And he told me that he still has the second version of this portrait on his wall, and he sees it every day. Beginning in the 1980s, artists used portraiture to celebrate social justice heroines like friends Rosa Parks. Artists had met and immediately bonded with Parks back in Detroit in the late 1950s. Her first tribute to Parks was a painting entitled The Beginning. Here, Lane Park portrays Parks as she knew her, a strong yet humble woman who defied racist policies with an everyday action of extraordinary courage. You may uh, recognize that the composition is based on a famous photograph, yet Lane's depiction is striking. The overall uh, uh, palette is a monochrome, uh, yet she really used these warm tones um, in, in Rosa Parks' skin to set her apart um, from the overall monochrome tonality of the bus and this kind of ghostly image of the lone white man that we see in the seat behind her. She glances out and beyond the bus towards three images, and these are symbolic images here. We see a church, a school, and an American flag, which are meant to symbolize Parks's um, well-known love of God and country. The original painting hangs in the Rosa Parks Museum at Troy State University in Montgomery, Alabama, but it was also reproduced in a limited edition lithograph that was signed both by Parks and Lane. A few years later, Parks sat in Lane's own backyard, and this is a wonderful photo that um, I just um, you know, uh, got access to uh, maybe like a couple of months ago, um, but isn't this wonderful where you can see um, the uh, profile of Parks along with the profile of the bust? This was a bronze bust which Lane created out of my heart wanting to honor her, her friend. In 1991, the work was purchased by the Anheuser-Busch Company and donated to the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. Some of you may know that um, in January of 2021, uh, the bust, which we can kind of see, it's a little bit cut off, but this is a photo of the Oval Office, was chosen for President Biden's Oval Office, where it resides alongside bronze busts of Cesar Chavez and Robert F. Kennedy, and painted portraits of Presidents Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and FDR. So proof of its artistic and symbolic power. In 1999, uh, Rosa Parks asked Lane to design the Congressional Gold Medal, which was awarded to her on June 15, 1999, in a ceremony attended by President Bill Clinton. I'm showing you at right um, the drawing that uh, the design that Lane did for the medal. Sadly, the actual medal as produced, while it bears Lane's signature, the U.S. Mint actually substituted another artist design, uh, one that's, which is most admit, uh, at least uh, Rosa Parks considered to be a very poor likeness of her um, for the final medal. Those without Oval Office access, which is probably most of us, can view two bronze portraits of Rosa Parks at the collected Detroit Gallery. At right is another bronze bust of Rosa Parks, and I believe artists have said that this is her favorite um, of, of, of the bronze busts because it captures the two seamlessly intertwined facets of her persona. 
uh, the uniquely personal, kind of that sweet smile, but also the timelessly universal. At left is a bronze statuette entitled Steps Toward Justice, which shows Parks ascending the steps of the Montgomery, Alabama courthouse. And uh, I will reiterate this at the end of the lecture, but Lane's portraits of Rosa Parks are the focus of an upcoming exhibition entitled Steps Toward Justice, um, which is opening September 11th at the Collected Detroit Gallery. And I will be doing a related talk on Saturday, September 25th, also at Collected Detroit, um, on Lane's civil rights imagery, including images of Nelson Mandela. And here's a wonderful photo. Uh, at left is a portrait of Nelson Mandela by Artist Lane. Here's a wonderful photo of Artist Lane and her husband Vince um, with Nelson Mandela. At right is a drawing of Desmond Tutu. Um, but I will be focusing more in that lecture on the civil rights imagery. Uh, Lane met Nelson Mandela through her work for an organization called Artists for a New South Africa. Here are two uh, wonderful photographs shot by photographer and Cranbrook alum P.D. Rierick. Um, at center we see a photo that I shot of artist Lane at work on a clay model for a bronze bust. At right is a detail um, from her bronze bust and you can really see um, clearly see the marks of her modeling tools, but even more importantly for me, the imprint of her fingertips on the surface of the cast bronze. It's as though she's at one with her artworks. Here's another show, uh, slide that provides a glimpse into Lane's creative process, and I'll be delving, we'll be delving more into that in the exhibition in the fall, kind of the design process. Um, but we see at right, um, she often works with photographs of the figures that she is representing to get some historical accuracy, and then of course there's the creative process where she um, you know, uh, makes her own design decisions. Uh, so here we see at right one of the photographs that she used uh, for research purposes of Rosa Parks ascending the steps of the courthouse uh, for the Montgomery bus boycott trial. And at left we see artists at work on the clay model. Um, we'll see in the final work, and again I'll elaborate more on this in the September talk, that she shows um, Rosa Parks reaching but not yet grasping uh, the rail. So this is one of those artistic decisions that an artist makes to enhance the impact of the work. Let's show you that again. Let's see, here we go. Another statement by the artist highlights what I call the reciprocal inspiration at work in Lane's art. That is, the channel that emanates from the subject, the person that she's portraying, and from God to Artist Lane, and then through the process of creating and exhibiting the work to the viewer. As Lane states, quote, the fine artist is always inspired not only by their gift given them, but for viewers to be lifted by the person whom you admire, unquote. However, she also asserts that the inner qualities of the subject, and she believes that it is those inner qualities, the spiritual qualities that really connect the viewer with the subject and the deeper values that they embody, she believes that these inner qualities are actually more difficult for the artist to capture than the actual likeness and more important. In 2009, Lane created bronze busts of two prominent women's civil rights activists, at left, we see uh, Lane with her great-great aunt, Mary Ann Shad Carey, um, a bus that she had created and given to her hometown of Chatham, Ontario, and she called this one of her proudest moments. She had also painted Mary Ann Shad Carey. Evidently, there's only one photograph um, that survives of her, um, and she painted her three times, capturing only in the third version both the warm, loving personality and the maturity and strength of her activist ancestor, whom she called my heroine. Lane's over life-sized bust of abolitionist and women's rights advocate Sojourner Truth was unveiled in April of 2009 in a ceremony attended by First Lady Michelle Obama. 
Significantly, it is the only sculpture honoring an African, or was the first sculpture, sorry, honoring an African-American woman to be placed in the U.S. Capitol. And I'm sure the first um, black woman sculptor as well, so two firsts there. Throughout the next decades of her career, bronze sculpture, often on a monumental scale and dealing with metaphysical themes, would become Lane's medium of choice. So we move on to part three and another anecdote. Artist Lane does not believe in accidents. Beginning in 1990, she had begun to focus less on painting portraits and more on creating bronze sculptures. She had arrived at the foundry one day, expecting to pick up a finished bronze. However, she was surprised to discover her work, the head of a woman, in mid-process. The hard ceramic shell was only partially broken away from the cooled bronze, revealing just a glimmer of the figure beneath. For Lane, the experience was a revelation. The unfinished sculpture was a visual metaphor for a deeper spiritual truth one rooted both in her civil rights imagery and in her Christian science beliefs. As she states, my civil rights images led me naturally to ideas about what and who we are outside of race. I went from there to my most important body of work, the metaphysical images of generic man emerging out of the ignorance of material concepts and evolving into spiritual awareness. But let's backtrack a bit. Beginning in the 1980s, so we're going back a little bit in time, Artist Lane had made a bold departure in her career and in her conceptual approach to art. She recalls being exasperated with portraiture, which had formed the bulk of her artistic output for decades. She decided to return to her fine art roots by studying with, uh, in a pa painting at UCLA with Jan Stussy whose classes were offering alternatives to the then dominant influence of abstract expressionism. Under Stussy's tutelage, she completed large-scale paintings of the human figure with a bold new approach to style and media. For Lane, the process was liberating, and you can see that this technique is very different, much looser, um, more gestural, more intuitive um, than her portraits. Um, you can see that they're larger in scale, they're painted quickly with uh, bold strokes often of this kind of expressionistic color. And she comments that she really wasn't um, consciously thinking of you know, what color she would paint. Um, she was really just kind of going with the flow, which kind of reminds you a little bit of, of Jackson Pollock's description of his technique. However, she also felt like she had returned home to her fine art roots. And here's some wonderful details, which you see, and you can see this is from 1987. Um, around this time, she started to exhibit her paintings, and at one point um, exhibited with a new group of artists, including um, David Hammonds. However, her biggest leap of faith came with a return to what you might call her first artistic love, and that would be sculpture. Significantly, the move was supported by her husband and manager, Vince Cannon, a relationship reflected, she asserts, in a 1982 bronze entitled Release, which we see at right. And at left is a wonderful photo, I believe from the early 70s, of artists and Vince. In the sculpture, we see the figure of, the wo of a woman in a pose of perfect balance. A man behind her encircles the woman's waist loosely with his hands, both supporting and releasing her. Lane explains the title, Release, stating that any growth between people occurs through a kind of loose reciprocal support based on mutual respect. The inspiration was clearly personal, yet the streamlined, idealized, and racially nonspecific physiognomies of the figures suggest a deeper, more universal meaning. In fact, Lane has stated, art critics have said that the work refer relates to the liberation of women in general and black women specifically. And this theme definitely plays in the piece, but again, I am after the metaphysical and not the particular. 
She would uh, elaborate, or this concept would evolve more in a later sculpture entitled New Woman, in which we see a rare feminist interpretation of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, this time with a woman inscribed in the circle. Women figured prominently in Lane's art during the mid-1980s when she was inspired by a young athlete named Renee Felton. Artist recalls that Vince discovered Felton, who was in training for the 1984 Olympic trials as a hurdler, running on the beach and asked her to model. Um, so, uh, you know, we're all kind of getting into the Olympics now, so I think this is a perfect um, kind of example of her art that's very different from what we associate with her. Felton agreed and actually stayed in um, Artist's studio for a while, and one of the results of this um, was a three-part bronze hurdlers, which we see at right. Artist um, asserts that the work had a message beyond sports, however. She, she says that it symbolizes the struggle of one human being overcoming the many obstacles of life. For Renee Felton, these uh, struggles included four surgeries for iliocolitis. Um, one interesting thing about this is that evidently, um, and, and artist was very much involved with the 1984 Olympics and actually did a poster for the Olympics. Um, the hurdler, Edwin Moses, actually looked at her, um, her sculptures, and this reminds me a little bit of the famous Moybridge photograph of the horse in motion. And he said that she's really the only person who has captured accurately um, the hurdler's gait um, and how the body, you know, the, the leg comes up to clear um, the hurdle. Um, and this almost kind of expressionistic take on the woman's body, which is somehow in full motion and yet frozen in time. At left, we see Celebration Two, another um, focus on a woman, this time a pregnant woman, with outstretched arms and an upturned gaze. Artists made two other variations of the celebration theme. One, a bronze relief. So the one is a freestanding sculpture, which we already saw. This is a bronze relief of the same theme. And here is the photo that you all saw um, you know, in uh, publicity for the lecture. Um, this one was shot by Eric Saarinen. We see um, her with a paper relief, and this is uh, made by using handmade paper, which was laid over the bronze and allowed to dry. She tells me that the paper medium, in contrast with the bronze, is a perfect metaphor for the fragile miracle of birth. The merging of medium and message came to the fore in Artist Lane's work during the 1990s. Inspired by her aforementioned foundry experience, Artist transformed both her technical and her conceptual approach to sculpture. And we can see this in a piece entitled Breakthrough. And here, um, looking back to that kind of uh, revelatory experience she had had at the foundry, um, she deliberately incorporated the vestiges of the casting process into her work. These include the hard shell, ceramic shell that is usually broken and removed and all these pieces, um, kind of rough pieces are smoothed away during the finishing stages at the foundry. Lane's process is an intuitive one in which she makes artistic decisions at every turn deciding what to leave. The resulting rough surface has been compared with that of archaeological artifacts and ancient sculptures. However, for artists, the transformational look of her work is ultimately metaphysical in meaning. She states that what she calls uh, these uh, emerging figures are a visual symbol for the idea that life and all of reality is in a continual state of evolution. Beginning with Breakthrough, she conceived the idea of pairing what she called an emerging figure, um, which has the casting material still on it, with its more finished variation, stripped of the casting material and coated with a patina. And we can see this in her birth series, where we see three variations of the same figure, and this also is the same model, Renee Felton. Uh, we see three variations of the same figure in bronze. Um, the one at right, uh, if we're looking at the image at left, the one at right without a patina, 
the one in the center with the patina, the one on the left being uh, the raw bronze with the casting material still attached. And we're seeing a detail of that figure here. And significantly, you can see uh, that she actually deliberately incorporated um, not only the vestiges of the ceramic mold, but also the sprue, which is the channel through which the liquid bronze enters the mold. Here's another uh, wonderful view of this three, uh, this birth series. This one was also shot by P.D. Rarick. However, for Lane, the ultimate source of inspiration was spiritual. Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health, a text which had guided her adult life for decades. These spiritual principles take center stage in Lane's magnum opus, a sculpture series entitled Emerging into Spirit. It was exhibited first in 2011 at the Forest Lawn Museum in Glendale, California as part of a one woman show and that's what we see um, over here on the left. It was also displayed at the Collected Detroit Gallery in September of 2020 and I believe what hopefully will be displayed again um, in September um, in conjunction with the upcoming um, exhibition of her work. The series shows the stages in man's journey from matter to spirit, embodied in six male sculptures. Significantly, the artist sought out African, an African model to represent what she calls generic man in her series. This choice counters the traditional Eurocentric bias in art and reflects instead the scientific reality of mankind's origins as a species in Africa. Artists viewed it as fate when she met her generic man, or at least the model for generic man, actor Jaiman Honsu, and you might recognize him from many films that he was in, Gladiator is one of them. She met him uh, just by chance, but again, for artists, there really is no accident, um, at the home of friends Joanna and Sidney Poitier. Honsu was a perfect fit both physically and spiritually, but also culturally, because he was from the African Republic of Benin, which is known for its tradition of bronze sculpture. The series begins with rebirth from matter. So I'm showing you on the left the installation um, from California. Here is a diagram kind of showing the progression, and here is the one on the, the lowest level, which is rebirth from matter. Here we see a darkly patinated bronze figure of a man who rises from death, drawn upwards by the power of God. The series progresses with emerging first man who stands erect but gazes upwards, inspired to shed the trappings of his mortal material shell, self, which is manifested and by the casting material that clings to his body. So you can see, again, this deliberate choice um, to incorporate the casting material. <clears throat> While the figure was conceived as part of the spiritual series, Lane has also created individual and monumental, as you can see from the photos, statues of the emerging first man. The first, standing more than 12 feet tall, was created for a private garden complex in Atlanta, Georgia. And here you can see, again, you get an idea of the scale of this. And this is a wonderful image, I think, which shows him kind of um, looking upwards um, towards spiritual enlightenment. A second six-foot version is at the California African American Museum. The series culminates with the figure of spiritual man whose transparent Kalanite medium and pose of perfect balance symbolizes the full realization of man in the spirit. So you can see that he is meant to be the one at the very top of the series. Lane documented her own spiritual transformation in a vertical triptych of self-portraits, which we see at left, entitled The Journey. In the series, we see a similar evolution out of darkness at the bottom towards the light, culminating in what artist deems her spiritual self-portrait, which is the one at right. Here, Lane's artistic journey comes full circle. 
the metaphysical musings inherent already in her 1941 self-portrait are here more overtly expressed. As before, the artist casts a discerning glance at the viewer, but here she inhabits a seemingly otherworldly space. She is stripped of her artistic paraphernalia and her face is bisected by a series of lines articulated in rainbow colors of ink and watercolor. Only one eye is fully represented, reflecting the biblical passage, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. This is my true spiritual self, the artist seems to say. And here's a detail with those uh, magnificent colors and lines uh, bisecting her face. In conclusion, I will go back in time to an artwork done by artists in the 1980s, one which demonstrates her relevance today as a pioneer in speaking out on social justice issues. It was a painful but perhaps not unexpected moment. In July of 1986, Artis was one of 12 artists who had been asked by the Statue of Liberty Foundation to create images of the statue to commemorate its 100th anniversary. Her work, entitled Tear on the Face of America, was unique in that it featured a young black boy enveloped by an American flag, but with a prominent tear rolling down his cheek. The foundation responded that it would accept the painting, provided that Lane replaced the tear on the boy's face with a smile. Artist Lane refused, explaining that her image, with the tear intact, expressed the continued need for the statue to represent both the conscience and the promise of America, that is, liberty and equal opportunity under God for all. Of course, Lane's image and message is incredibly relevant today, as people across America and the world come together to demand that the freedoms embodied in the statue be fulfilled. At left, we see uh, Hubert Massey's Power to the People mural. This is a aerial shot of that. Um, this was done in 2020, but I understand will be um, uh, you know, repainted um, every year so that it will be a permanent fixture. At right is a wonderful drawing that um, I just saw at, at um, Artis's apartment um, during the summer and I hope um, will become a, a bronze bust someday. This is a wonderful sketch she did of John Lewis. Lane once stated that discrimination can either devaluate you or give you the impetus to speak. Indeed, despite facing the twin obstacles of race and gender throughout her career, artist Lane has spoken and continues to speak through her art. And true to the God-given message she first perceived as a child, it is a message intended to educate and inspire mankind. As Lane once stated, the journey of growth from matter into spirit is universal, non-racial, non-divisive. We all need to be on the path together. Uh, before I conclude and give um, Artist Lane a chance to say a few words, I just want to give you the first chance to register for two upcoming events uh, which just went live on Eventbrite. The first is the opening of the uh, Steps Towards Justice exhibition, which is featuring Artist Lane's portraits of Rosa Parks. This will be happening at the Collected Detroit Gallery on September 11th, which is a Saturday, and this is that wonderful image that I referenced in the lecture. And the second event is a talk, Instruments of Justice, on the wider topic of Artist Lane's civil rights imagery, and that's also happening at Collected Detroit on Saturday, September 25th. Both events are part of Detroit um, Design Corps' Month of Design Festival, and if you don't know about that, um, look it up online. Um, a month of Design, it uh, happens every September, and there's just uh, events happening all over the city of Detroit um, pretty much every day of the week in the month of September. And both events represent a collaboration between three great organizations, Collected Detroit Gallery, uh, Art Impact Connect, and the Metropolitan Museum of Design uh, Detroit. So I hope to see you all in the, uh, this fall, and I thank you all, especially Artist Lane uh, and her family members um, for being here tonight. Thank you.
bring artists up. We're going to bring artists up just to say a few words. <laughs> Let me put this down a little bit for you. There we go. How about that? Is that good? <laughs> you. I loved your talk. I love you. And uh, the words I wanted to s try to explain is that uh, my mother named me artist, she, very unusual name for all the others. My sisters had traditional names like Norma and Carol and Dolores. And that, so that the students used to tease me about it as, as though I had made it up to promote myself or something at uh, art college when I won that four year scholarship. But also, I'm just grateful to still be here to see uh, the changes and uh, the work of young artists of all races becoming aware of the need for strong, strong images to uh, change uh, the idea of a super race or bigotry, uh, to uplift and give courage to people who don't paint or draw, uh, and the gift of writing. I'm just in awe of that. Uh, so thanks for